this continent is changed out of all recognition from what it was in the early 80s and was confronted by a series of repressive governments with no democracy, no freedom of speech. There's so much hope for the continent. In spite of the paradox, you know, it's a rich continent with a lot of poor people, but there's so much going for it. It's got a youthful population, stability by and large has returned, economic growth consistently high. Poverty has also declined over the years. God blessed us with natural endowment. I'm very hopeful about the future of Africa. Global trends prevail on Africa. The developing world is in fact uh, coming up. It's only the beginning. It's not the, the end of the struggle. The current Ebola crisis in West Africa has been very challenging and very difficult. What Ebola has done is to expose the severe governance challenges that exist within all facets of our society. The tragedy of Africa is that of misplaced priorities. We are sitting in Ghana today. It is the number two producer of cocoa. And yet, ask an average Ghanaian whether they can afford a bar of chocolate. They will not be able to. So me standing in the line on the election day in this merciless Ghanaian sun, there hasn't been a, a logical link between that, that my citizenship act and my life. The bane of our problem is corruption. Massive, widespread corruption. Zambia is very rich, and there's no reason why a Zambian should go without a meal. If you look at the way the contracts are signed, it does not benefit Zambians. Natural resources uh, belong to the people who live in the country where the resources are located. They are expropriated and misused to the benefit of people coming in to mine them. In South Africa right now, community members are still talking about going to relieve themselves in a bush because there isn't proper safe sanitation. They get raped when they go to the toilet. They get attacked. So yeah, it's a grim situation. Something is going on. Slowly, you have this consciousness of the people that they have to control the people to whom they are giving the power. Even in situations where governments are brutal, do not respect human rights. How many of your own people can you lock up every day and keep your legitimacy? So when civil society comes together, begins to organize and put pressure on the governments to do what is right, it makes a difference. Our civil societies are very strong about the exercise of their rights and they know how to claim it by networking among themselves, by demanding it of their governments through the media, and if it comes to that, they claim it to the justice system. Transparency for me really entails having the courage to challenge those that exercise power and to, to use it for the benefit of, of, of the common good. Saying, I've got rights, but I also have the responsibility to ensure that those rights are fulfilled. Social auditing is a tool any community, but particularly working class communities, can hold government accountable, can hold the private sector accountable to ensure that services are delivered. We are going to make citizens very, very powerful. The woman who is living in the village, if we can give that woman that power to track the funds that are made available for the clinic in her village, that's a concrete connection between the process that we are trying to influence and the lived experience of the citizens. There's a great sense of accountability from almost my all the mining companies, particularly the companies that uh, we, we have taken to court. Communities are now aware of their rights and uh, a lot of them can confidently sit with mining companies and negotiate compensation. The results of the social auditing in, in Kailicha, in Cape Town, there was an immediate change in the material conditions of people in that community. And you can actually effect small changes which over time could lead to a more transformed society. There's been cases in Uganda and in Kenya where people have been abused by police or their houses raided and the court said People, irrespective of their sexual orientation, are entitled to dignity. They're entitled to freedom from cruel and inhuman treatment. So even in countries like Uganda, you've had positive judgments. 
all throughout West Africa, you've seen civil society step up. They've been much more strengthened by this uh, epidemic. Part of what we've done is to call on our government to take a very serious look at public health service delivery in our respective countries. If we manage those resources better, we think that we can prevent Ebola from reoccurring again in the sub-region. It may not be in a year, it may not be in two years, but definitely these are challenges that will be overcome. The future of Africa is for us to realize self and then determine for ourselves what we think of when we think of development. Democracy is not an event. Democracy is a process, uh, and you don't achieve that in a day. There is not, no amount of money pays for the satisfaction of seeing somebody who has spent 21 years in, in prison for a crime they did not commit coming out. There is no amount of money that pays for the establishment of an African court on human and people's rights. Because you know that the gains from these things are going to outlast any one of us. One of the things that const constantly gives me hope is the resilience of the ordinary African man, the ordinary African woman. With the younger generation, there's a greater sense that they belong to one common Africa. There's a generation that wants to see Africa move forward and is working very hard to ensure that the image of Africa is changed.